Bible's here, Luke 18, 35 through 43. Um, the one thing you and I need most in this world is we need the mercy of God. Amen. Crying out to Jesus. Um, we need God's mercy. Queen Victoria was having her picture done and a portrait done of her and at a private unveiling, she was a little miffed at the artist and what he had done. She complained that he did not do her justice and she wanted some things tweaked. So he went back to tweak them, but uh, he mentioned to a friend of his after she left, he said, she didn't want justice, she wanted mercy. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> A lot of times we think we want justice. In reality, we want mercy. We're often confused about the two. And when we look at Luke chapter 17 and 18 and 19, these four encounters on his way to Jerusalem really illustrate how easy it is to get confused over justice and mercy. We see these encounters really bringing to the forefront this distinction between justice and mercy. Someone illustrated the difference to me years ago when he said, uh, he shared, if a, if a person murdered my son, he said, and I, I let the law take its course, that would be justice. If I pled with the murderer to let me take his punishment, that would be mercy. And if I brought the murderer home, adopted him as my son, and I gave him all the love, the privileges, and the inheritance that I would have given my son, that's grace. And that's the depth of God's mercy and love for us today. That's the depth of God's grace and mercy for us today. That is why we call it you know, amazing grace. It is, it, it is unfathomable and uncalculable mercy of God. So when it comes to approaching the God of this universe... The one thing that you and I need most is the mercy of God. There are several people that illustrate that in the Bible, but I think none better than the person we are encountering today, and that is Bartimaeus, this blind beggar. I love... The, how this story unfolds because it is so simple, so straightforward, so unpretentious about just crying out to Jesus. So you have your Bible. I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 18 as we look at verses 35 through 43 this morning. I'll invite you to stand in honor of God and his holy word. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what it was. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. 
Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, he regained his sight and began following Jesus, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we would, we would ask that you teach us indeed what it means to cry out to Jesus. In, our, in whatever state we find ourselves in today, Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm us with the presence and power of your mercy. Show us anew and afresh not only the depth of our need, but the provision of mercy. Open our eyes to, to grasp it. Open our hearts to receive it. Lord, there are many, perhaps even here right now, and it is the prayer of their heart. Lord, hear their cry. Speak as only you can for your glory and for our good. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right, before we launch into this cry for mercy today, we need to clear up some apparent contradictions that are presented to us about this particular situation with Bartimaeus. First of all, um, if you read the Gospel of Mark, Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, Matthew 20 records this event. Mark chapter 10 records this event. But they're a little different. And so let's, uh, let's kind of clear up a couple of uh, apparent contradictions. The first is Matthew and Mark, uh, or, or Matthew says that there are two blind beggars, all right? Mark and Luke only record the one. Mark, in fact, gives us his name. It is Bartimaeus, all right? And then secondly, Matthew and Mark both tell us that they, this encounter was as they were leaving Jericho in Luke 18. It is while they are approaching, verse 35, approaching Jericho. So how do we resolve that? Well, first of all, uh, the first one. There's no contradiction about the numbers. There would only be a contradiction if... Uh, Mark or Luke said, one and only one. All right. It would be like, um, you know, who was shot the day that uh, Kennedy was assassinated? And all the newspapers, the headline is, is that the president has been uh, shot. But he wasn't the only one that was shot that day, right? Uh, Connolly, the governor of Texas, was also shot that day. Uh, but the focus was on the president of the United States, and that was what garnered all the headlines. Uh, so there's no contradiction unless the text were to have said that it was one and only one, which it doesn't do, all right? Then secondly, what about this? Well, entering Jericho or leaving Jericho, uh, which is it? Well, it's interesting, remember, Matthew and Mark are are both Jewish in nature. Luke is a Gentile in, by nature. You say, well, what's the difference uh, there? Well, actually, there's probably a significant, significant difference about how they would view Jericho because Jericho actually had two locations, right? It had, and if you were to visit Jericho today, and I might bring you back some pictures in a few weeks, but uh, you actually, if you wanted to visit the site of Jericho, you would actually go to two different places. You have a Jericho of the Old Testament and a Jericho of the 
New Testament, and they were about a mile from each other in the, the same, you know, obviously the very same location. But uh, when, they, when, when Herod really rebuilt Jericho in the time of the New Testament times, it wasn't on top of the old Jericho, the Jericho of the uh, Jewish um, uh, Old Testament. And so that would be, you would actually walk first by the Old Testament Jericho before you would enter into the New Testament Jericho. And that's obviously what is going on here. Uh, Jesus had, was on his way. He's passing by Old Jericho to the uh, New Jericho. And these blind beggars uh, led by Bartimaeus are right uh, there. And so if you ever had uh, questions, there they are cleared up. If you didn't, forget about the first part. And let's go ahead and talk about why we should be crying out to Jesus. I'm going to give you two reasons why today you ought to be crying out to Jesus. The first is because, hey, you need it. Jesus is passing by, and you'd be crazy to let this moment slip away. This is what we read about with this blind beggar, Bartimaeus. He seized his moment of mercy. How many of us let mercy slip by when we need it most, but we're afraid to ask. We don't seize the opportunity before us for all kinds of reasons. We need to take a page from Bartimaeus. In verse 35, Jesus is approaching and he is sitting by the road begging And he hears a crowd going by, and he begins to inquire what's going on. Here, Bartimaeus and those that were blind, they have been stripped of everything, of dignity and self-worth and value, being able to work and provide for their own, and they've been reduced to nothing more than beggars. In fact, they would have been the type of people that that rich young ruler would have pointed to and said, I wonder what sin he did for God to punish him like this, right? That self-righteous attitude. I mean, even the disciples had it. John chapter 9. Hey, Jesus, we all see this blind man near the temple, I wonder what he did, what his parents did, that he would be born blind. Here this guy has been stripped of everything, and yet he is the one that inevitably is the brunt of all the religious judges. I wonder why he is under the curse of God. But is he? Uh, I think we're going to find out just the opposite. He's yeah, the, 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 the contrast between that rich young ruler who walks away sad and broken because of his self-righteousness and this man who is going to find the mercy of God is stunning. It is so striking and it is very purposeful that Luke has put the two in juxtaposition to one another. He is driving home the point of the mercy of God for those that are in need. And so, this one, he's just thinking it's an ordinary day to beg. He strategically located himself along the corridor of all those Jews who would be going up to Jerusalem for the Passover as Jesus is. From Galilee, they would have all been making the same trek. He's probably already encountered about 10,000 
or more in the last couple of weeks. He strategically placed himself. This is, in one sense, for the beggar, this is his busy season. This is the opportunity for him to really take advantage of the crowds. But in verse 36, he says something is going on, something out of the ordinary of the crowds that would be coming from Galilee. He can feel it. He can sense it. And so he inquires, verse 36, what, what is uniquely going on here? What's all the buzz about? And so in verse 37, they respond, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so what does he do? Verse 38 he called out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Sweet, simple, straightforward, right? Unpretentious. He hears that Jesus is passing by, and he cries out for this mercy prayer. Jesus, have mercy on me. Do you realize that this is the prayer in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament? It is this prayer that is asked of Jesus more than any other. It's just simple, sweet, to the point. He's not the first and he's not the last to cry out, have mercy on me. Yeah, Jesus, have mercy. I love the Greek is actually a verb. Right? Uh, English, we can't relate to that. You know, verb is action, right? And, um, and that's why it's a verb. If we were to, to use some slang, it would be... Uh, Jesus, mercify me. Do for me what only you can do. You know, I'm in a state, there's nothing I can do. I need your action upon me, and I need the action of mercy upon me. It's interesting that in English, we either have it as a noun or merciful as an adjective, but, but it is predominantly a verb in the Bible. We translate it poorly, have mercy. It's really, Lord, mercify me. It is this simple prayer of mercy. And it's the one prayer that is sure to melt the heart of Jesus. It's the one prayer that he answers over and over and over again. It's not embellished. It's you know, not fancy. It's just the cry of a heart in need. If I were to line us all up and said, you know what? We all got to stand up. We all got to get in a line. And we're all going to go through that door there. When we all open that door and we go through that door, we're actually going to walk into the throne room of God. What are you going to say? Yeah, and, and if if I'm uh, if I'm sitting there and and I'm I'm first in line, I, I'm going to turn to the person right beside me and say, "I got one thing, Father, merciful me." Right? Is anybody going to say, uh, "Not me"? I think uh, I, I I think I'm going to be able to just say, "Hey, Lord, consider my track record." I, I, hey. Remember what, when I did this? Remember when I did that? We, we would pity the person that would dare have that mentality, wouldn't we? We would, we would literally look at that person and say, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? You're, you're coming before the God of this universe who knows everything 
knows every heart, thought, every, every action, every, every thought, every intention of the heart. And you're going you're gonna to appeal to what you've done? Jesus, mercify me. Why should we cry out to Jesus? Because we all need his mercy. He is passing by, and you'd be crazy to let this moment pass. And secondly, it's because the Lord wants you. He wants to give mercy. It's what he wants to grant. It's what he wants to provide. With God, there is always mercy and more mercy to come. Amen? More mercy and more mercy to come, which should make you want to dig in rather than running and, and saying, I can't, I can't come before God again. Are you crazy? Yeah, this should make you want to dig in and say, Father, mercify me. Give mercy to me. Give it to me. It's not about deserving. Mercify me. And so look at what he does in verse 39. This is so cool. He digs in, right? Those who led the way were sternly telling him to shut up, be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, son of David, mercify me. I love verse 39. Here, they give him this stern warning. Enough! You're making a spectacle of yourself. You ever felt that way? Coming before the Lord, crying out for mercy again? You ever heard those voices? Enough. Really? You're coming again? I mean, don't you think... You should cut your losses and forget about it. What's Bartimaeus doing? He hears the commands telling him, be quiet. But what's his attitude? I'm not going to let this moment pass me by. So he cries out even more. You know what's really interesting? When you look at verse 30, um, uh, 38, that he called out, and then you look at verse 39, that he cries out. There are two different Greek words. The, the, the first is boao, uh, uh, and it just means to call out loudly, right? But he now goes from that, and he's being told, shut up. And not only does he maintain the level of crying out that he had done before or calling out that he had done before, he's now crying out. The, the, the Greek word is kratzo, by which we get the word crazy. Literally. It's spelled the same, except the uh, the very ending is is a is a, um, a omega rather than our y. You know, C R A Z O. He cries out. He is crazy in crying out. In fact, Greek lexicons define this word this way. Listen to this. This is a shriek when. And I'm quoting, all right? This is my interpretation. It's a shriek. When one utters sounds without words capable of being understood, consistent with that of a mentally disturbed person. <laughs> this guy is, he's being told, shut up. 
Don't make a spectacle of yourself. And he just flips out. He is screaming out. Bart and his buddies are, are you know, man, they are not going to let this moment pass them by. You know why? Because they recognize that this isn't merely a, the best chance they got to actually be healed of what was plaguing them, which in this case was blindness. In your case, it might be something totally different. But they realized this wasn't their best chance. This was their only chance. You see, we become desperate for mercy when we truly realize this isn't just option A, B, C, or D. This is our only chance. The only chance we have for healing. It's not like Bartimaeus and his, and his buddies were thinking, well, you know what? Okay, if it's not Jesus, it's probably going to be somebody else tomorrow, right? I mean, nobody opened the eyes of the blind except Jesus. They knew that Jesus wasn't merely a good option. For mer when it came down to the issue of their needing mercy, he was the only option. And the beauty is that, dear friend, the closer you, you get to God, the more you realize how much you need mercy. The closer you move, the more you realize mercy intensifies the closer you get in your walk with God. Mercy actually intensifies, and everything about God reveals that. Everything that God taught us about himself reveals that. The very layout of the temple picture illustrates that, right? Right? I mean, you had the divisions in the courtyard, and, and as you approached, you approached, first of all, uh, in the courtyard with the, the cleansing and the washing of purification, and then you had the blood uh, of the altar, and then you walked into the holy of whole, I mean, the holy place, and there you had the light of life and the bread of life to illuminate the way. And it's all being funneled to what? The holy of holies. You are being led by mercy into an encounter with mercy. And when you went into the holy of holies and the high priest would go in that once a year and he would carry on the day of atonement, the, the, the day of cleansing, forgiveness, he would carry the, the, the blood and he would, he would sprinkle it upon the altar, right? In the holy of holies. And the altar was the throne of God. And what did God sit on that you walked into? You, he sat on the, what was it called? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. And if you, if you look through the book of Exodus and, and the, the you know, 20 some chapters that deal with the building of the temple, Everything is accounted for. The depth, the length, the height, everything is specified in the most detailed way. But there's one element about the temple that is missing one critical part of its design. It was the mercy seat. It's interesting that when it came to the to the throne of God that resided in the temple. You know it's 
width, and you know its length. But the one thing that's omitted is its depth. To illustrate for us that when it came to the mercy of God, it was limitless. There isn't a depth of the mercy of God that can be exceeded. The throne was called the mercy seat. The picture is that you, you, you move toward mercy and as you receive mercy, you move to even greater mercy. Mercy intensifies the closer you come to the Father. And so here, he, he's shrieking because he knows this is his only chance. I got to tell you, verse 40 to me is really a, a very sad verse because we read Jesus stopped and he commanded death that he be brought to him. It's interesting in chapter 18 that Jesus has been illustrating for his disciples that he is to always be approached, right? And he illustrated that with the children after the, uh, he, he gives the stories and, he, and the, the children, the disciples were trying to keep the children from him and he said, don't hinder them, right? And, and so, again, here we read, they are trying to keep this man who is crying out for mercy, the one thing that he needs and the one thing that, that our Lord can give. And there are hindrances. Apparently, even among his own disciples, keeping this guy at bay. You know, I tell you what, I, I just think about as the church, God, would God forgive us for the times the church in general and if, you know, and, and we as, as a body should ever communicate to someone in need that uh, we hinder them in any way, shape, or form from feeling like they can come to Jesus. Jesus has to command them, bring the man to me. And so he questions him in verse 41, what do you want me to do? And look at the response here, underline it. He said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. You want a verse on the deity of Christ? Here it is. This is a great verse for the deity of Christ. The Greek word for Lord can be used just generally and uh, uh, as uh, someone of high respect. And so oftentimes when, uh, you know, if someone who is against the deity of Christ, uh, you can't just use the fact that, that uh, people called him Lord because they can always say, well, it's just a, the title of reference, right? Okay. But I want you to think about this for a minute. Who can open the eyes of the blind? Not just a respectful person. Not just a person of high regard, right? Everyone knew that there was only one who could open the eyes of the blind, and that was God. And, and so here this man is coming before Jesus, and he says, Lord, Lord, I want you to open my eyes. I want you to provide for me. And so Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. 
the one prayer that Jesus is not going to deny. That's why he says in John 6, all who call upon me, I will in no way cast aside. You see, anybody who says, I can't come to Jesus again about this issue in my life. They are telling you they know nothing about the mercy of God. That is a self-righteous, hypocritical thought. And it reveals nothing more than that they know nothing about the mercy of God. Cry out to Jesus. God's mercy God's mercy is infinite in its reach. I love how Lamentations 3 puts it. His mercies never cease. Isn't that beautiful? Think about that in your time of need. The mercies of God never cease. That means that the mercies of God are available for any sinner under any sin. There is no depth to the mercy seat of God. You're not going to exhaust it. In fact, the closer you are to him, the more you recognize how much you need his mercy. Any sinner... Any sin. Because the mercy of God is infinite in its reach. It can reach you at any moment, at any time, under any circumstance, or any sin, any issue in your life. Do what you need to do. You need to cry out to Jesus. That's why I love that song, and I appreciate Blake singing it, because it, it, the scenarios that it pa paints is all kinds of life circumstances, right? All kinds of things that will break our hearts, all kinds of things that will crush us, break us. And the first thing we must do is cry out to Jesus. His mercy is infinite in its reach. And lastly, it is infinite in its loving power. Think about that. It's infinite in its power to deliver you, to empower you. Look how Paul states it in Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. But God is so rich in mercy. How rich? He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, dead, in other words, there wasn't a pulse. We were dead. You ever felt that way? We were dead because of our sin, dead to right. And he gave us life. But he did more than just give us life. He raised us from the dead. He, he empowered the same power that raised Christ from the dead, Ephesians goes on to say. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. The wonderful thing about the mercy of God is that, that with God there is mercy and there's more mercy to come. That, that, that opening picture of one who truly receives mercy is they receive mercy so that it is the corridor through which God's grace is poured. God doesn't just meet you and me with mercy and stop there and say, you know what, but grace you're going to have to earn. No, he uses the corridor of mercy to flood us with his grace so that he can pour out the same love that it, with which he loved the son 
He pours out to us. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 17. Oh, Father, is that high priestly prayer. Father, show them that, uh, that you love them just as you have loved me. Wow. We are loved in the beloved. And mercy is the corridor through which that grace is forever poured. Why? Because the mercy of God is infinite in its power to save you and to empower you with a grace so that you can overcome, so that you can be the man and the woman and the young person of God he's called you to be, so that you can live that overcoming life and get out of this trap that you are in. So here's what you got to do. You got to cry out to Jesus. Amen. See, if you, number one, are broken by the guilt of your sin, then cry out to Jesus for saving mercy. It all begins right there, right? That's where it all begins, right? Dear friend, that's, that's what opens up the corridor of God's grace. Cry out. And if you're a child of God and you've been struggling and you feel maybe trapped or enslaved by some habitual sin in your life, then don't be foolish. I, I can't come again. Are you crazy? Cry out for delivering mercy, the type of mercy that will raise you up and infuse you with the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Cry out, oh, Father, I need that empowering mercy in my life. Listen, Satan is going to tell you, in fact, he will sternly tell you, and he may even use some uh, misspoken Christians along the way to sternly tell you to shut up. Don't you do that. You can't come to Jesus again about this issue in your life. You know what you got to do? You got to go crazy, right? You, you got to say, hey, I'm just I'm going to crank it up, man, because Jesus isn't my best option. He's my only option. Cry out to Jesus. If you feel broken by rejection, feeling maybe unwanted, then cry out for his comforting mercy. He will be the father you never had. If you feel wounded, misunderstood, and inadequate, cry out for his sufficient mercy to cover you. And if you feel empty, if you feel lost and confused and weak, then cry out to him for his enabling mercy. Dear friend, he will, he will be that good shepherd who will enable you to walk in good paths. Your life isn't over with. Not when you have the mercy of God. A good shepherd can turn evil for good. A good shepherd can restore the years the locust has taken away. You just got to cry out. Tell Jesus what you need. I need that mercy so I can get rid of this issue in my life. I need that mercy. I mentioned to you at the very beginning that this was the number one prayer asked of Jesus. And that's true. But in reality, it's the number one prayer offered in the Bible. There's no prayer offered more times in the Bible than this. When was the last time you offered it? The number one prayer in the Bible is simply, be merciful to me. It's time to make that your number one prayer as well. 
Let's start now. Crying out to Jesus. Wherever you are, cry out to Jesus. I'm going to give you that opportunity in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. and I would invite each of you in these moments to do just that. Take this opportunity. Perhaps you came here today and you knew the one thing you needed most from God today was mercy. But somehow along the way, Someone or something has convinced you to be quiet and just suffer. <clears throat> suffer in your sin, suffer in your pain, suffer in your sl- enslavement, suffer in your rejection, suffer in your wound, suffer in your weakness. Just sit and suffer. But dear friend, Jesus is passing by right now. And you'd be a fool not to cry out. It's not a very elegant prayer, is it? It's just the prayer of a broken heart. But it's one that will garner his attention. In fact, he will command that you be brought to him. Cry out. Lord, may may those who are broken by the guilt of their sin find in you the saving mercy that can only come at the foot of the cross. May those, Lord, trapped, wounded, and weak May they find in you the words of the good shepherd. Your faith has made you well. May they walk out of here rejoicing of having been mercified by you. And Father, may you translate that mercy into true empowerment. May this be the day that they are restored and healed and delivered. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand for our benediction.